Hi, it's Dr. Elizabeth Clotis here. We'll just give it a couple more seconds um, for folks to join, but welcome. Um, I look forward to my discussion with you. I have my puppy here in the in the room, so if I if I look down, for, um, it's because he wants attention. <laughs> I'll show you what he looks like. Ah, <laughs> this is my dog. He's like the thing that that um, he was who welcomed me home when I came home. So, okay, Dex, down you go. All right. And I think with that, maybe um, we'll get started. So, um, welcome. Uh, this is Dr. Elizabeth Clotis. I'm cardiologist and founder of Step One Foods, and. Um, Tonight is kind of a session that I really wanted to have, um, it, it, just to ref, kind of reflective of the um, recent health experiences that I that I've had that I wanted to share with you, um, the the kind of learnings that I, I took away, um, and also because originally this Facebook live chat was supposed to be about our New Year's resolution and how we were doing, and to kind of encourage you to um, keep going with those changes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the reason why I, I really wanted to um, speak with you tonight is because what I realized after my experience is that um, the goal we set out for ourselves at step one and, and for the step one community was was all wrong. We need to have a different goal for, for this year. And um, and I'll and I'll get to that. Um, but first I just wanted to kind of let you know sort of what happens to me and and how that's I think shaping the way I, I look at things um, going forward. So, okay, here, here's my story. Um, so, um, we, just to give you a bit of a background, um, my family has a timeshare in Costa Rica. We've been going to Costa Rica every year for 10 plus years, love it there. It's beautiful. The people are amazing. The weather is great. It's, we always have a wonderful time. And this year, um, in an, kind of in an unusual um, twist, for the first time ever, I had a two week block to, to go. And, and so we had, um, and this is the, the place where our, where, our, um, where our unit is, is on the, on the Pacific side of, of the country. We fly into Liberia, which is, which is the smaller of the two cities, two major cities, I guess, in, in, in um, Costa Rica, San, uh, San Jose being the capital. Liberia is much, 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 much smaller with a very small airport, but, you know, but it still accepts international flights, et cetera. So anyway, we fly, we fly into there and then we go to a resort that's about 45 minutes um, away from, from town. Um, and so we had, um, what, what I planned was for the first week to be actually um, a getaway for the executive team from step one. We were going to meet and kind of talk about, you know, our company and where it's going and what we could do better, the, you know, what, what, um, you know, how, how we're going to move forward as we grow. I was really excited about it. Um, and then the second week was, was supposed to be, you know, lifelong friends, people that um, some of whom have known each other since college. So, you know, long, long, long-term friendships and, and uh, we've known each other for forever and just love spending time together. And so that was, that was week number two. Well, week number one kind of fell apart because a few days before we were supposed to go, uh, a couple of the folks that were attending um, contracted COVID. And, and so the whole, um, kind of the whole idea behind the week was, was altered and we made the tough decision to, to cancel um, that part of the trip. But, you know, I still had the week off. I didn't have patients scheduled. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll just go and I'll just go by, by myself. And, and I haven't taken a vacation by myself in a long time. I'm sure as for you, you know, 2020 was a tough year. Um, you know, my, my dad passed away in 2020. My mother went through major surgery. It was, it was a, ta it was a taxing year. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this is a sign that I'm just supposed to, you know, have a, have a week by myself. So I went 
and I had a great time. It was, I ate how I wanted to eat. I exercised every day. I, um, <coughs> I just had a wonderful time. And so I left on, on a Sunday came and my husband came on, on the Friday. This is a long winded way, but because to, to tell you all that things that happened, because you'll see how this all actually matters to the, to the entirety of the story. So anyway, so I was having a great time and, and every day, you know, I was challenging myself to kind of a fitness goal. And I've been about three years ago is when I really started to take my own advice. And I tell my patients all the time that, you know, prior to three years ago, I was, I was a bit of a couch potato. I mean, I, I did things, but I, I didn't have any regular exercise routine. You know, my eating patterns were good, but they weren't as good as actually what I advised my patients to do. And about three years ago, I said, you know what, I'm just going to start following my advice, my own advice. And I did that and, and I, you know, kind of embraced it. It was really hard to get started, but you know, by, by, by the time, you know, by the time I was in Costa Rica, I'd have to say at the age of 57, I was the fittest I'd ever been in my life. I was challenging myself to run up this really steep hill. And every day I'd, you know, like place the marker in my head a little bit farther. And every day I'd make it a little farther. And by the time my husband arrived on Friday, I'd, I'd actually, you know, almost achieved what I had hoped, which is to get to like a flat part of this giant big hill. Anyway, and I have to tell you, there were times I looked absolutely ridiculous, like a little almost cartoon figure, like I'd be running, running, running up the stair, up this hill, almost making no progress. But every day I did it, I did it, I did it. Anyway, so okay, my husband arrives on, on the Friday. We're having a nice time. On the Sunday is when our, you know, the, the next group of friends is supposed to arrive. And so that day we go to the grocery store back to Liberia, 45 minutes one way. And while we're, while we're shopping, I start to feel something in, in my back and it's, and it's this weird pain that I've, that I've never had before. And, you know, but I, but I kind of blow it off and, and thought, well, maybe I, I did something, you know, that day while, while running, um, we finish our, we finish our grocery shopping, um, in a place called Price Smart, which is actually the, I guess, Central American version of Central America version of Costco is like awesome. But anyway, so as, as, as my husband is checking out, I like, I go like, I, I just have to, you know, go to the restroom. I just, I don't feel good. And, and so I, I sort of sat there and I was getting more and more pain and I was getting really nauseated. And so when we, when I came out, we just got in the car and I said, you know what, we just, we just got to go back to the resort. Like there, we're not going to do any other shopping. Let's just, let's just go back. Well, on the way, on the way back, I became real. like the pain was unbelievable. So I, I had a kidney stone. I was passing a kidney stone and people say it's, you know, it's, it's as, it's as bad as childbirth. I would say it's like one degree less than childbirth, but, it, but it's, it's pretty close. And so I was just, you know, couldn't find a comfortable position, just sort of writhing in pain. Um, fortunate for us, the, you know, the, the resort has, has a physician, um, you know, kind of available. So he met us when, when we, when we arrived and, you know, basically said, yep, this looks like, like a kidney stone. And so gave me something for pain. And then we turned around and went back to Liberia again to get a CT scan to, to see what was, what was going on. In the meantime, you know, my, you know, I see cardiologist, my husband's an orthopedic surgeon. We're like, you know, he's calling, you know, um, you know, other physicians that we know, okay, what do we do now? Okay. We need a CT scan. Okay. We got, we we're going to the, to get the CT scan. And by the time that happens, you know, our, our friends have, have arrived. I'm still getting the CT scan. We send them on their way to the, to the resort to kind of ahead of us. And, and then I, you know, yes, you have a, you have a kidney stone, but it's only three millimeters. And so that's, you know, those typically pass on their own. This is just going to take a lot of fluids and, you know, drink, drink, drink. And, um, you know, and, and let's get you something for nausea, something for pain. This will pass. So, okay. So I, we go back. Um, I don't actually even meet our friends. They go, <laughs> they go have dinner. Um, what okay so so then you know the next day i get up it's now it's monday and i i kind of sort of stumble into the the living room we're sort of staying in the the one one condo and i see my friends and you know i say hello it's for the first time that i've seen them and i you know i have a, a little bit of breakfast but I, I go right back to bed i just don't i just don't feel good and and so you know, back to nausea, not being able to eat. So an IV has started, more pain medication, you know, I'm, you know, waiting this out and waiting this out and waiting this out. And 
by Monday night, um, I had thrown up my breakfast. I'm still not eating. And I start to feel really bad. Like I'm having trouble breathing. I'm, you know, the, the pain is continuing. I, I have this unrelenting nausea. And um, this is where some of the miracles start to happen that happened for me. The friends that came were not just, you know, college friends and, and buddies. Um, <coughs> they were, as it turns out, my, my rescue team. Um, one of the one of the people there was was an emergency room physician. The other one was a critical care nurse. And they took one look at me and sort of said, like, we're going to the hospital. So back back we go racing to, to get me to the hospital. And um, I'm I'm having a lot of trouble breathing at this point. I'm just very, very sick. And I just remember getting to this hospital being put on this gurney, them taking the chest x-ray, you know, they're like, they're trying to get IVs and all sorts of stuff into me, trying to get my blood gas tested, which was so, so painful. Try and get IVs in, which was so painful. And then I will never forget this, the chest x-ray is done. And there's a little, you know, I mean, there, there's a little viewing box to, to the side and, and they put up the film and I turn my head and I see my chest x-ray. And I just said to myself, oh, no. And I, that's actually a lie. It was an oh with an expletive afterwards. But, but I, I saw that chest x-ray. I've seen chest x-rays like that. Those are chest x-rays of people that don't make it. My lungs were white. Um, they were, and, you know, and of course, the, the people that looked at it said, COVID. This is COVID. She has COVID. We can't take care of her here. You have to take her to this other hospital, the, you know, the, the public hospital, go over, we, you know, get her out of here. This is COVID. I said like, it's not COVID, but okay. Um, and in, in the meantime, thank goodness I had my ER physician and my critical care nurse because they knew exactly what needed to happen. They were, you know, they basically took over. They said, okay, she needs this and this and this and this and, and, you know, by the grace of God, um, the, you know, the, the people that were there, you know, followed those instructions and gave me the oxygen and started giving me antibiotics and, and, you know, and, and everything that I needed to, <coughs> to survive the trip from, from the one hospital to, 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 to the other. Um, and then it got really scary because um, I was, I just couldn't get enough air. I couldn't get enough air. And I remember turning to my friend and asking her saying, am I going to die? And I, and, and she looked at me and she said, you know, no such luck, buttercup. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so that kind of gave me a little bit of a, of a psychological boost. And, um, and then the next two days are an absolute blur. I just remember having oxygen, being forced through my nose into my into my lungs. You know, if, if any of you have ever been on oxygen, have had that little, you know, that little nose thing around you, you know, typically the flow is like two liters a minute, four liters a minute. You know, those are those are typical flows at home, maybe six, sometimes eight. Um, my flow was 70 liters a minute. I mean, it was like I was getting blasted with air in, into, the, into the back of my throat. And with my nausea on top of that, I was just like, I just wanted to like pull this off. And yet if I did, I couldn't breathe. So it was like, I, okay, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, take all the, I'll take all the nausea. My blood pressure was dropping. My kidneys had shut down. Um, they had to basically put me on a, um, an adrenaline drip and just pour fluids in, just pour, pour, pour fluids in to try and keep my, keep my blood pressure um, up. And, um, and so the next thing became getting me out of there because, you know, this was, this was a, um, you know, the, the, the limitations of medical care in, in a place like Costa Rica are significant. Um, it's, people are lovely. They, they, they try the best they can, but it's, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not the same as, as getting care in, in the U.S. I mean, the infrastructure is just so different. 
And at one point, the, you know, the, the physician there pulled, you know, pulled my, my husband aside and with a translator was, was going through my statistics. And when, when someone is in shock, which is what, which, which was I, what I was in, a yeah, septic shock, presumably infection from, from the, from the kidney stone, um, there are there are calculators you can use to to determine you know how, what what the likelihood of of death is right <coughs> depending upon you know what the how much oxygen the person needs what their blood pressure is right have what their blood gas what their kidney functions etc all these all these little factors that you blow up, put into a calculator and it spits out a number and says okay what are what is the likelihood that this person is going to die um, as as a as a result of the, this current illness. Well, my likelihood was 85%. Um, but actually, you know, looking back, that 85% assumes I'm sitting in the ICU at Mayo Clinic, right? Where everything is being done correctly, where everything that I might possibly need is available and can be deployed like that um, to, to help me um, get through this, <laughs> get through this illness. <coughs> so, Probably in reality, had I stayed in Costa Rica, that was probably 95%. Like it's just, it's sort of the odds. And I, and I went from someone who was perfectly healthy to someone within 48 hours that was basically a death store. And it happened like that. So the next thing was trying to get me out of there. Um, and it was complicated because I needed so much oxygen to to breathe <laughs> that they were contemplating that they may have to you know intubate me to put 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 me on on a ventilator to actually safely transport me which as someone who who knows um you know being put on a ventilator is is a big big deal because getting off the ventilator becomes really hard um, and so I really did not want to be on a, on a ventilator. I knew that if that if that happened to me, I would be sick and in the hospital for you know probably a month. Like it's just it's it's that that big a swing in terms of in terms of what happens. Not in every situation. I don't I don't want to imply that you should always say like I don't want a ventilator. But in this particular sort of setting, when the when the lungs are so so affected it can it can it can actually be a detriment to be to be put on to be put on a ventilator if you don't absolutely need to be so <clears throat> as it turns out the first attempt to at trying to get me airlifted out failed because the the operator couldn't get the plane there um, <laughs> safely <coughs> so we ended up actually not leaving on the tuesday which was which was the hope but leaving on wednesday and I actually think that that extra day helped stabilize me a little bit and um, allowed me to, you know, get enough of the adrenaline and, and all these other medications and antibiotics, actually, another 24 hours of antibiotics to help so that I, you know, they, I didn't have the 70 liters of, of oxygen, which would be untenable. You know, they, they couldn't, they couldn't put enough oxygen tanks on a plane to get me transported anywhere out. Um, but I ended up trying what's called a rebreather mask. So you, so you put the, the, the mask on top and then there's extra oxygen flowing, but it's not at 70 liters anymore. It uses way less, less oxygen, which, <laughs> made the potential of me being transported by, you know, a medevac plane more, uh, more likely without needing to be intubated. So then the other thing was, where do I go? You can't just put someone in a plane, you know, put them on oxygen and take off for, for the US. There has to be some, there has to be a hospital that's willing to accept you. So I had my emergency room physician, my critical care nurse, and the other person that was with us had a brother who was in Miami, who lives in Miami, whose neighbor happens to be best friends with the head of urology at Mount Sinai Hospital. And it was this, like these little strings of, you know, of, of connections and, and, and people just coming out of the woodwork to help. And before you knew it, I was being accepted as a patient to 
Mount Sinai Hospital in Miami. So I had a place to go. Okay, next complication. That Monday, when all of this just sort of, when, when my condition went south, was the first day of the regulation that you needed a negative COVID test to be, at, you know, to be allowed back into the U.S. within whatever, 72 hours of, of your, of your, en- of re-entry. We had made arrangements, you know, for, <laughs> to get COVID tested, <coughs> assuming we were leaving, you know, like normal at the, at the end of the week. So we, we'd had it, we'd had that all lined up, but this was, this was like out of the blue. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'd had COVID tests because they tested me a bunch of times. I was, I was negative. This was not COVID. Um, but my husband, you know, all of a sudden didn't have a way to get tested. And so, um, but he'd already had his vaccine. And so it took another string of people, you know, well, I know this one, I know this person and I know that person and, and I can help and I can help and I can help. And eventually we got to, you know, our state senator who, who got a, who, who arranged for a waiver for my husband to be able to accompany me to the U.S. I mean, it's like the number of, of, factors that came together is actually astonishing to me. It's astonishing to me. And it all happened while I'm just, well, I'm just concentrating on breathing. So the day of the transport, these two wonderful, wonderful flight nurses arrive and they kind of take a, they assess the situation and they decide, you know what? Yep, we can do this without putting her on a ventilator. Again, another weird thing. When they took off for the, to, to pick me up, they had failed to remove a, 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 um, an oxygen tank. They were traveling with an extra unauthorized oxygen tank just because for whatever reason, it wasn't taken off the plane. It was supposed to, but it wasn't. So they kind of looked and said like, I think we're gonna have enough oxygen to get her there. And and I was transported um, to Miami and, um, and then hospitalized at, at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, and I was in the ICU in between, you know, between Costa Rica and Mount Sinai. I was in the ICU for six days <laughs> and then <coughs> in a step down unit after that. Um, some of the most amazing things I, I recall, and I'll tell you about my Mount Sinai experience too, because that's really um, where I learned a lot about, kind of had a, had a lot of time to reflect on care and what we do right and what we do wrong. But just some of the things I went through were, were amazing. I mean, I'll never forget that chest X, right? I'll never forget like thinking, this is it. Like, this is how I leave this earth. <laughs> um, and then, you know, being delirious. I was delirious in Costa Rica. I would close my eyes and I would see these bizarre tunnels of orange and concrete. And, and I'd open my eyes and I'd look and I'd say, no, 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 there's, there's ceiling tiles up there. Like I'm, I'm in a hospital, I'm in a hospital. And then I'd close my eyes again and, it would, and I would be back in that, in that tunnel. Then I'd open them and I'd see floating numbers and, and words and I'd be trying to figure out what it is. Um, and whose handwriting it was and, and, and what the message was and, and thinking like, I think I'm losing my mind. Um, and then thinking, well, if you think you're losing your mind, you're probably not losing your mind and just kind of, you know, trying to, to, to sort of figure that out. And then the, the shortness of breath, the air hunger that I had, for, you know, f- from, from it dur- in Costa Rica and then during the transport, actually there was a, there was a moment when we were on the plane where they had to switch the oxygen from one tank to the next. And I went bonkers. I was like, I, <laughs> they almost had to hold me down because I couldn't, I couldn't get my breath. And, 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 and those flight nurses were so amazing. And before we left, they had said, okay, Liz, okay, you're going to just concentrate on, on your breathing. You're going to slow it down. You're going to take deeper breaths, which I couldn't. I couldn't take a deep breath. My, my lungs were full of fluid. I couldn't expand anything. I was doing the best I could. 
And they, and I just remember they said, meditate, don't ventilate, meditate, don't ventilate. They knew I didn't want to be on a ventilator. Everybody knew that that was, that would be a big setback if I had to get on a, get on a ventilator. And it kept me focused and it gave me a goal. I just had one singular goal was not to get on that, on that ventilator. And then arriving in the U S and then going into that hospital and just being like, it's familiar. This is what it's supposed to be like, just that huge sigh of, of relief that I was home and I was going to get amazing care. Okay. So then now I'm in at Mount Sinai and I'm fabulous, fabulous care. I was so, so fortunate, um, to be there. Um, but things were going sideways. Um, I was kind of getting better, but my labs were, were off the charts bad. I had, so I started out with normal kidney function, which is, you know, creatinine, creatinine is what we use to measure kidney function. And I started that, um, normal, you know, under one, I don't know, 0.9, whatever milligrams per deciliter. By the time I got to Mount Sinai, it was like 3.4. It was like my kidneys, shut down. They were, they were just, they were on, they were on strike. They were not, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be doing their, their job without a lot of help. And so I was put on Lasix. If some of you um, may, may have had some experience with, with that medication. So it's a, it's a water pill and it's used to help with edema and get extra fluid off. Normal, normal doses of Lasix are kind of 20, 40, 80 is the typical range. So 20 milligrams a day is considered a low dose. 40 milligrams is kind of a moderate dose and 80 is considered, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty hefty dose of Lasix. Some people need more, but, but typically those are kind of the, <laughs> the ranges. <coughs> well, they put me on IV Lasix, not by mouth, but IV at 10 milligrams per hour. So I was getting 240 milligrams. So three times the, like the big dose. And just to put that in context, I'm five foot four. And on a good day, I might weigh 108 pounds. So this was, this was just a ton of, a ton of um, fluid reducing medication going, going into me, trying to get the, the extra fluid off. Um, and then, but, but my kidney function was starting to get better as, as they were getting rid of the fluid, as, as my blood pressure stabilized, as the antibiotics were, were kicking in. But then my platelet count was falling, you know, normal platelet count is around 150. I'm like 75, 50, 35 on, on consecutive days. At some point when you're, when your platelets are, are very low, you think you're going to bleed. It's actually the opposite. You start clotting and you start developing all sorts of, all sorts of complications from, from, from that. And then my white blood cell count. So, so an indicator of infection wasn't getting better, even though I was on all these antibiotics and, and they, they were going up and up and up and up. So normal white blood cell count kind of upper limits is around 11,000. When I arrived, um, at Mount Sinai, it was around 24,000, but every day it just kept going higher and higher and higher. So that by about a, you know, <coughs> I arrived on the Wednesday by Sunday, my white blood cell count was 40,000. It just like, it just kept, kept going up and up and nobody knew why nobody could figure out why it was, it was so high, why my platelets were going down. And so they started, okay, does she have cancer? Does she have, does she have, you know, abscesses like pockets of infection that we're just not getting to. And, and so at, but at the same time, like, I was better. I, I, I needed just a little bit of oxygen. I, I could sit up in a chair. Um, so they moved me out of the intensive care to kind of a step down unit where I still had the, you know, the monitor on, they were still monitoring me, but I was, I was, you know, one, one step lower from, from critical. And so that was progress, but still like these weird, weird labs. So the next day they sent me for, for a CT scan. And this is when, you know, some of my lessons come. Um, I waited and waited and waited for this, for the CT. I was in this holding area. They, you know, there's all these other kind of more emergent cases that were, that were ahead of me, you know, from the emergency room, whatever. And so by the time it was, you know, by the time it was my turn, I'd been waiting in this holding area for two hours 
And the, the young man that came and got me, Leon, he was very apologetic and, and he started to tell me about, you know, what was involved in a CT scan. And I, and I said, you know, Leon, you just should know I'm, I'm a cardiologist. I've had a CT scan before. You, you know, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to worry. You don't have to explain it. I'm, I'm, I'm all good. And then he said, oh, well, so where do you practice? And I said, oh, Minneapolis. Said, Minneapolis, what are you doing in Miami? So I started telling him a little bit about my story. And, 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 he, and he wheeled me in. There's, there's two CT scan rooms. He said, she, and they happened to just like, they were busy, busy, busy. And all of a sudden, both of them opened up. And he said, hey, why don't I put you into this room? It's, it's a little cheerier. And, and, and he put me down on the, you know, on, on the stretcher. And I looked up at the ceiling. And they had this panel in the ceiling, which was just a backlit photograph, but it was giant and it was beautiful. It was this blue sky and palm leaves just kind of coming into the sides and a little blue, like little white cloud. And I looked up and, and I cried. Um, and I knew it was fake. I knew it wasn't real. And yet I looked up at it and I, for the first time, I sort of had this sense of hope. I had the sense of hope. And it was a stupid, it was a stupid thing on a ceiling, a backlit photo. And so I like, I literally had my entire CT with me just like bawling. <laughs> <laughs> and um and then you know and then anyway I was taken up to, uh, up to the room and my nurse came in and she said you won't believe it your white count is better and and it was it went down oh my god I'm I, I'm gonna like take up the whole session it's okay I hope you put with me I'm just gonna give you my story um and and my white count was better and and I and it was like that was real that 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 light and the and the hope and this sort of feeling in my chest when I took a deep breath like all this energy was coming in into me. Um, so happy, happy, happy. It was great. And then the doctors came in and said, Well, yeah, your white counts better. But your liver doesn't look right on that CT scan. There's all sorts of multiple nodules, things that are coming up, and we don't know what it is. And you know, and of course, in between, you know what they're saying, like this could be cancer. So I'm like, oh my God, now, now I have like no wonder my 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 white cell count is crazy. No wonder my platelets went berserk. Like there's I'm there's something fundamentally wrong on, on, underneath. So next day <laughs> MRI um, long story short apparently I am a walking atlas of benign liver pathology so you know you want a cyst I got that you want a hemangioma which is like a little blood vessel abnormality which is benign I got that you want focal nodular hyperplasia which also benign I've got that so if you ever want to see you know everything that could look bad <laughs> on a scan with a liver but means nothing I've got it. So that, that all turned out fine. And then my, my white count continued to sort of come down and then it kind of leveled off. And then it finally, you know, got better. And, and I was released on Thursday. So I got there on a Wednesday. So I spent eight days in, um, at Mount Sinai and then whatever, Monday through Wednesday in, in Costa Rica. So here are my, and I came home and I came home on no medications and no, no oxygen. It's like, it almost like it never even happened. I, I bounced back. I bounced back. I, like I, it's, it's actually astonishing from where I started to, to where I went to, to where I came up to. It was almost like I'd been walking along the side of, of the Grand Canyon and I just boom, tumbled down like instantly. And then we spent the next, you know, multiple days trying to, to, to lift me out of there, but, but I got out. So reflections on my hospital stay. Um, it was lonely. It was really, really lonely. Um, you know, COVID does not allow people to, to visit. Um, and, and I felt very much alone. Now for some of it, I don't remember it all. I was, you know, I was getting all sorts of medications. I was tired. I, you know, I, I barely, 
could tell you what what happened on on those days but once I was in in the step down unit um, I was very aware and and it, and it felt bad um, so I, I hope that we get through this COVID so we can we can have people be together again miss that human connection I would also say that speaking of um, I I noticed that it, there's some some humanity is gone now from from the medical interactions that that we have with with patients I was on the other side so I was the recipient I wasn't the provider um, and some of the humanity is gone um, you know every time the and and again I had amazing care I in no way do I mean to to imply anything other than that but every time the nurse came in the nurse didn't come in by by herself or himself they came in with a big computer screen and keyboard and, and I would say they interacted more with the keyboard and and the computer screen than they did with me um, everything you know entry 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 everything has to be documented and I, and I get why that's important um, but you know I, I had to reach out I had to be the catalyst to to sort of start the conversation and develop a a personal connection with with the people that were that were taking care of me and that was that was a little disappointing I you know I haven't been in in the hospital for for many many years I was you know I mean I trained at Mayo in in the late 80s early 90s and you know back then we we sat on on the edge of the bed and we held people's hand and 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 we talked to them we didn't have clipboards and we weren't entering data we were just present with the patient and and that's that's missing um i don't know how we get that back um but i'm you know in in myself now i'm going to be much more um, cognizant of making sure I return phone calls, you know, on time that I, that I answer emails that I, you know, that I, that I spend time with my patients. I do that already, but I, I think maybe, you know, I want to make sure that I, I do it right, that I, that I haven't lost some of that humanity, um, along the way. Um, the other thing I learned is that potassium tablets are awful. I, I am, I'm going to do everything I possibly can never to prescribe a potassium supplement. They are like this big. And even when you break them in half, they're still like this big. Um, oh my gosh, terrible, terrible, terrible. So I'm, so potassium supplements and, <laughs> and replacement, I'm going to, I'm going to find ways for, for workarounds because they are absolutely miserable. Another lesson, actually very practical travel insurance. Um, as it turns out, in Costa Rica, you're only allowed to enter the country if you have proof of travel insurance with, you know, with at least a minimum of $50,000 to cover expenses. And so we had that. We never get travel insurance. We've never, you know, ever um, done that. And yet it was mandatory this time, which, which was, you know, which, which was a saving, which was a saving grace. Um, and then, you know, the last just kind of reflecting upon um, what allowed me to survive this. And, and I would say that it was three main things. The first was, um, I, I mean, actually not the first. The first was the, out, the unbelievable outpouring of help and prayer and positive energy that flowed my way it was and it wasn't just friends and family it was friends of friends and strangers and you know there was a there was a um uh, a mass intention that was that was said for you know on my behalf back home at one point again through all these little strings of people being being connected together at one point i learned that that the all the nuns in south dakota were praying for me I mean, it was it was astonishing you know the fact that somehow we got a letter to allow my husband to to come into the into the country like how did that happen so many people had to come together and 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 use their energy and use their resources to help me and they did it's it is humbling it is astonishingly amazing and and i will never forget that part and it was a big reason why I made it I mean there's 
I must have a purpose. I hope that's step one, but I must have a purpose. The second was the outstanding medical care that I that I received. I really I am so grateful for the for the amazing care that that was um, that I that I was able to access. And last but not least um, is the fact that I got sick at a time in my life where I was as fit as I had ever been in my life and I was as healthy as I had ever been in my life. And I think that made all the difference in terms of my recovery, my ability to not go on the ventilator. You know, there were, I mean, I look back and there's so many places where, you know, where things could, could have gone wrong. I mean, if this had happened while I'd been there alone, I'd be dead. If this had happened when it was just myself and my husband, I'd probably be dead. I really needed that rescue team that by, just by sheer, I don't know what, some destiny arrived on the day that I got sick. If I'd been put, if I'd been evacuated a day earlier, I'd probably still be in the ICU at Mount Sinai. I mean, so many, so many different ways this could have, could have gone wrong. But my big message and the reason why I wanted to talk to you and the reason why I gave you all that background to, to sort of share with you what I just what I just went through is that last part, that resilience. It is so important. It's so important. We take, you know, we take our health for granted. We say tomorrow we'll do something or, or we'll do, do something little today. And yes, it's important. Every small change makes a difference. And I'm a big proponent of that. You know, I write about that all the time in my blogs, but we need more. So my message is it's, you know, I got it wrong. I got it wrong for, for, um, our resolution this year. It's not, you know, just one small extra change and, you know, and, 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 you know, be gentle with yourself. No, be firm with yourself, you know, get ready because something like this could happen to you. You know, this year, somebody who's watching this, you know, they or someone they love will get diagnosed with cancer. Someone will have a heart attack or bypass surgery. Someone will, you know, will, will, will have, you know, some other health challenge that, that they just weren't expecting. And, and when you're resilient, when you have, you know, fed your body correctly, when, you, when you're fit, you are so much better able to withstand whatever comes your way. Um, I, I heard, uh, you know, a quote I think is Mike Tyson has said, you know, like everybody's got a plan until I punch him in the face, you know, and, and that punch could come from anywhere and it could come at any time. And so I urge you to do what you can to, to gain resiliency, get as healthy as you possibly can eat better. And, you know, and not just step one, eat better all around, start moving your body. And if you're already moving, move more, um, get, you know, move along the spectrum to, to, to better health so that you're, so that you're better able to withstand anything like this to, that comes your way. This is what I learned. I was so, so fortunate. If this had happened to me three years ago, before I was this fit, again, I might be dead.